just welcome. Welcome you. Just, I'm really grateful that we can come together. I'm really grateful that you guys uh, come all the way over here and come out here and that we can just grow as people, that we can grow in, in this God that we love and that we serve. And, and, I, and I pray that, uh, that indeed that as we continue to come, like our worship, right? I, I absolutely love our worship. Sometimes there's technical difficulties. It happens. And with God and our walk and our walk with Jesus, sometimes there's technical difficulties. Usually we like to call that sin. And it was really great that, that Richard in the back decided to get up and come to the front and, and, and come up with a solution. And sometimes we each need that. We need someone in our life who can see what the problem is and then come and help us along the way. And, and I, that's what a community's for. That's why we're growing as a church and as a people because no one should have to walk on this earth alone. No one should have to walk this walk alone. You should always be able to have someone who loves you enough to come and change a microphone when it needs to be changed or to help you when you're hurting, to comfort you when you're mourning, to laugh with you or at you depending upon the situation, to encourage you and to be with you. And uh, so... We're moving into a new season. Literally, we are, we're entering this winter season. This, I, I love the, kind of the beginning of winter because it's nice and dark in the mornings, and I'm not a morning person, so the whole idea that my room doesn't get you know, bright at 5 a.m., I love that. I love if I wake up at 7. I don't know. Is it 3? Is it 7? It could be the same. I, I love that feeling. I love that time. But even as a church and as we grow as a church and as we grow as a community, we're going to come into this new season of studying the book, the actual Bible. And, and I'm really excited about that. I'm excited that we get to study the Bible because this is my passion. This is what I love. This is, I love when people are, are learning and then they come and they have questions about the Bible and we can just sit and we can just talk about it. I love that, that, that whole feeling of that this, these words which were written thousands of years ago are still so relevant in our life today. And I pray that as we begin this year of, of studying the Bible, and there might be some interruptions here and there, right? Because we're not legalistic people. We're going to follow God and, and seasons and what's happening in our lives. But it just happens that this is the perfect season on our calendar to begin to understand what was happening in some biblical times. And uh, there's, there's a very special time. And so that's why I have decided, oh, no, there we go. We're going to actually begin reading the book of Luke. Now, I feel like God has a lot of information in the book of Luke for us. Now, how many of you got a head start because I, I, I mentioned it the last couple of weeks and started reading the book of Luke? Ooh, wow. Yay, a few people. Honestly, that was like more than I was expecting. I was more looking like, oh, yeah. So essentially, it's going to be really easy. We're approximately going to do a chapter a week. Now, some weeks, like next week, we're only going to do about half a chapter because we've got a great big party coming next week. So we're going to celebrate and enjoy as a family. But for the most part, if you just read one chapter a week, you're going to be doing well. You're going to have the, the whole information. Now, I can't read word for word every single uh, passage in here for the time that we have. But, you know, if you come early, really happy to sit with a cup of coffee and we can read it together. It's like, oh, that could be fun. So we can come on Sundays, we can gather together, we can begin to learn, we can begin to grow. Now, as we begin to get into this book of Luke, it kind of, I don't know, maybe I've already done, this is my favorite joke, so I'm sorry if I've done it before. But, you know, there's, there was a time that the, the rabbi of Jerusalem went to visit the Pope. And then he walked into the Pope's office. It was really great. It was fantastic. It was beautiful, filled with artwork. But the most stunning thing was sitting on the Pope's desk was a golden telephone. 
And the rabbi uh, was really curious about this golden telephone, and he asked the Pope, hey, Pope, uh, what's that golden phone? And he said, it's very simple. Anytime I need to talk to God, I just pick it up, and I can talk to God. And the rabbi said, I would love to talk to God. And he said, well, you, you know, you, you could use it, but it's a little expensive. And the, and the rabbi was like, to talk to God. And so he picks up the phone, and he talks to God for five minutes. And he hangs up. And he, whew, Pope, that was the most amazing conversation of my life. And the Pope said, you know, you, you talked for five minutes. That's going to, that's going to cost you about Obikman one. $5,000. And, and it's like, no problem. He, he paid the money gladly, and they had their conversation, and they moved on. And the Pope was out traveling the world over the next year, and after some time, he comes to Jerusalem. So he thought, I should visit my friend, the rabbi. So he goes into the rabbi's office, and the rabbi's office was, like, filled with all these, like, artifacts from ancient Israel and, and these things. But the Pope immediately notices, and he says, you've got a golden telephone on your desk. And the rabbi said, well, after you had one, I had to get one. And, and the Pope said, you know, I've been traveling a long time. I really need to talk to God. Yeah, go ahead. So the Pope picks up the phone, and he talks to God for more than two hours. Many, many problems. And after two hours, he hangs up and goes, Rabbi, thank you so much. I desperately needed that conversation with God, um, um, but uh, I'm sorry, I talked for two hours. How much money do I owe you? And the rabbi was like, oh, Obek one, 50 cents. 50 cents? 50 cents? How, how can it only be 50 cents? I talked for two hours. You talked, you talked for five minutes, and it's $5,000. How can it be so cheap? And the rabbi said, ah, from Jerusalem, it's a local call. <laughs> and, you know, many of you have studied the Bible. And many of you have studied the Bible from many people around the world or, you know, from all different theological perspectives and all different things. But one of the joys of being a, a Jewish believer in Jesus and Yeshua is the fact that I was raised with, a, with a, a much broader and a much fuller understanding of some things. And then I studied because, you know, being a good Jew, we study. And I studied, and I studied, and I studied. I studied in Israel, and I walked the places. And that's my passion. That's what I love. And I want to come now and let us open up something like the book of Luke, something that you've heard taught in passages, messages, Sunday school. Uh, there's cartoons about it. There's everything you could possibly imagine. But let's begin to open up this book. Let's open up, like, what is this really about? Now, if any of you are new believers and new Christians uh, within the last year and you haven't read much of the Bible, I would strongly encourage you to read the book of Mark. Mark is a very uh, straightforward, very simple reading, just the, just the story. And, and that will just familiarize you with the majority of what's going to happen in Luke. But Luke, let's get into this because, because you want to know God a little more. Now, now, if we begin to think about Luke... Who was Luke? Now, there's a lot of questions about who Luke actually was. So there's one school of thought that says that he was a Gentile doctor from Rome. There's another school of thought that says that, no, he was actually a Jew Roman citizen like Paul, who just happened to have a Greek name. Sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. It's not working now. Can you progress? Oh, there we go. So when we begin to think about, yeah, isn't that exciting? What was a doctor actually like? What was a doctor in the Roman times like? So sometimes we think of it more like, you know, these guys in these really great robes, and it must have been so nice. Now, with a few exceptions, most doctors were considered very low class. Now, during the time of this era, they had just begun to actually create medical schools. So up until this point, anyone could be a doctor simply because they said they were a doctor. 
and they could sell anything. You know, it was like the original snake oil salesman and, you know, with all kinds of things. Like, there was no actual training. And essentially, if your patients got better, you got famous. And if your patients died, you moved town. And those are actual implements from Roman time period. Now, anyone here an actual doctor? Now, some of those things actually look very similar to what they use today, but um, thank God, not exactly. But Luke was a famous doctor. Luke, we don't, we don't know a whole lot about who he is, but we know that he was able to understand both Jewish culture and Roman culture. We understand that he had both access to Roman cities and Jewish cities. We know that he was a companion to Paul and that he walked with Paul and he traveled with Paul. He is most likely the author of both the book of Luke and the book of Acts. There's all kinds of other things about that. But Luke and Acts go very much hand in hand. So if you read the book of Luke and then you go into Acts, they just flow together. John and Acts, not so much. Luke and Acts, much, much better. And when we begin to think about Luke, when we begin to think about this man who was transformed, this man who walked with Paul, this man who we don't know how much was he an eyewitness to versus how much was he the uh, witness to the eyewitnesses. But he compiled a group of information. And in the very beginning of Luke... If you want to have in your own Bibles, it would be good if you have your own Bibles during this time so you can like look it up at yourself as well. But in, in this, it, just at the very beginning, it says, Inasmuch as many have undertook to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered to them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainly, so that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And now that's really now the focus of this book, Luke, that you may have certainty. You as the reader of this book, were you a night witness to these stories? Anyone? Okay, no Methuselahs in the room. That's great. I've met a few people who thought they were like, you know, 1,000 years, 2,000 years old, a little crazy. So it's nice to see that we're sane in the room. But you need to have certainty. How can you have certainty about the story? Certainty about who Jesus is. And that's this purpose of Luke. All of these parables, and it's all written in a way to not just tell you it's true because I said that it's true. This is very, very important. Mark is written more like that. It's true because I wrote it to be true. Luke is more written about, I want it to be true. I want you to know that it's true, but I want you to figure out that it's true. I want you to to see something that's a little bit more, something that's a bit more hidden or or hinted at. This book is perfect for Asians because it's filled with the indirect. This is one of the most indirect books of the entire Bible. And so one of the problems with some of the ways that this book has been taught is that it's taught from Western perspective, which is very direct. So sometimes they're thinking that it's being very direct when really, even though this is being communicated, it's that indirect way so something else is actually being stated. And we're going to begin to look at that. We're going to open it up. We're going to see how it is. Now, who is Theophilus? Most excellent Theophilus. You can go to the next one. So Theophilus. Now, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of academic writings about Theophilus. And I think it's very, very fascinating because just like the book of Luke is filled with parables, even who this Theophilus is is almost a parable in and itself. Because if you look at him as this great Roman legion, uh, Roman officer, Roman um, uh, official, some people believe that he was even possibly related to, he was the older brother of a future Caesar. And there's several famous, the problem is there were several famous Theophilus 
during this time because the name Theophilus either means friend of God or beloved of God. It's a really great name. And both Romans and Jews use that name. And so we end up having that this idea is this Theophilus, this Roman centurion, this Roman uh, authority, this high up within even the, the upper echelons of Rome. And it's very possible. It's also as possible that some say that he actually became one of the high priests of the temple, a Sadducee. He was the brother-in-law to Caiaphas, who was also Theophilus. Now, if you look at it from that perspective, now the book also takes on another whole form because when you look at Luke, Luke understood Jewish theology. Luke understood the Jewish culture, and he understood, and it actually is the book that is directly dealing with who the Sadducees were. Now, just a quick reminder, Sadducees were people who did not believe in an afterlife. They believed that the ruling class of Israel were to be the priesthood. And that they were the most intellectual, the most righteous. They were the ones who had the divine right, even though there was no divinity, to be able to rule. So they basically believed this is it. When you die, you die, and it's done. Yeah, Sadducees, not, see, that's why they're sad. You see, you know. Oh, I like the delayed. So Theophilus, so even this idea, who is the most excellent Theophilus? Well, you could be Theophilus. I could be Theophilus. We could either come from a total ignorant perspective, or we could come from a very well-educated perspective, and this book has something for everybody. This book has something for the pagan and the righteous alike. And so we're going to begin to, to look at this and open it up a little bit more. Next one. Oh, oh we're, we're, were we on Herod already? Okay, we can go back. Or oh, let's leave it here. Sorry, I don't know the order at the moment. Um, when we look at, it's very hard to see. I'll have to use darker fonts next time. So when was the book written? And when we think about when the book was written, it was either written in 60 A.D., 63 to 68 AD, 80 to 90 AD, 90 to 110 AD. Yeah, what does that mean? Nobody knows. Nobody knows exactly when it was written. There are clues in the book, however, that most people, most scholars believe that the original letter was written before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Because there was a prophecy about the destruction of the temple, but there was no mention about its fulfillment. And so when we actually look at this, we can realize that this is pretty close to one generation from the time when Jesus was on this earth, this book was written. And in antiquity time, that is like, you know, might as well be uh, tweeting, you know, in live stream at the moment. Like one generation was nothing for that, for that time. They were very accurate with historical culture, very accurate with oral culture. We have tons and tons of evidence about that. So what does that tell us? It tells us that we can pretty much with certainty believe in the eyewitness accounts that are being recanted in this letter. We can have pretty much certainty that the historical context is pretty accurate, and it is. All of the historical things that are mentioned in this book have been verified through archaeology and historical writings. And so we can end up having this narrative. Now, the only debate is, do you believe what this narrative says? Do you believe what the book of Luke is going to say? Will you believe in the testimony of God, in the miracles of God? How will you yourself respond to it? And that's the difference between the eyes of your heart being awakened, as Paul wrote, right? He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be awakened, And that's what I pray. I pray over the next several months that the eyes of your heart would be awakened, that your mind would be awakened, and that the miracles that are contained in the book of Luke, the stories that are written in the book of Luke, would not stay simply stories in antiquity, but they would become the living truth and the living word in your life. I pray that you would be able to grab a hold of some of these things and know with certainty your own faith and know with certainty that you too can live an extraordinary life. 
that you would grab a hold of something far bigger and greater than you could ever have imagined. Now in verse 5, as we begin to further into this introduction, Luke begins to say, It was in the days of Herod, king of Judea. There was a priest named Zechariah. Now, King Herod is a very important figure at the beginning of Jesus' life. And he's a very, yes, this, this picture, I really liked this picture. I searched through many King Herod pictures until I, like, I fell in love with this one because this one is the most accurate of what King Herod most likely looked like towards the end of his death. He was fat. He was morbidly obese. He most likely had gout, and when he died, it took six men to carry his coffin to his grave. Yeah. He was an evil genius. And you need to understand that Herod fundamentally changed Israel in his lifetime. Now, he ruled... Oh, did I write? Oh, I didn't write it down. Oh. Anyway, he ruled for about uh, 30 to 40 years leading up until just after the birth of Jesus when he died. And when he ended up, so who is Herod? You know, he, he ended up marrying the last princess of the Hasmonean line of the kings. That's that, that time period between uh, the return from Babylon and up until the Roman conquering. He was not ethnically Jewish. He was ethnically Arab. He had converted for the sake of being able to rule Judea. He was best friends and went to school with Mark Anthony and Octavius Caesar. So you all know about like Octavius Caesar, the the nephew of Julius Caesar. So he lived through that whole time period of when Caesar, you know, got Brutus, stabbed him in the back. And, and yet, during the Civil War between Mark Anthony and Octavius, that was the whole Cleopatra story. You guys know about Cleopatra? So this is just one generation before Jesus was that whole story of Cleopatra that, that launched a whole civil war. And Herod didn't know who was going to win, Mark Anthony or Octavius Caesar. So he actually hosted Cleopatra and Mark Anthony had a love affair in Israel. But, of course, we know what ended up happening. You know, they ended up dying. Octavius Caesar ended up winning and conquering. And then Herod was like, oh, my friend, you know, my good friend. And then he had to make things right. And so he actually built a city. And in the city, he named it after Octavius Caesar. And it's called Caesarea or Caesarea. And in that city that he built, he had underwater concrete. He created a man-made pier that was two miles, three kilometers long, that created a natural port. He built a city in 25 years that was pagan upon pagan. And in the center, right when you came up, there was a huge temple to Zeus. And the face of Zeus was Octavius Caesar. Herod was a very smart man. Now, Herod, though, was also very paranoid. He always thought someone was trying to get him. Someone was trying to kill him. He thought his wife was trying to kill him. So he put her on trial and he had her executed. He was the original Henry VIII. And then he thought his sons were trying to kill him. So he killed three of his sons. And then he thought the nobles were trying to kill him. So he actually created pretty much what happens today is nonstop entertainment. He had theaters and he invested money in theaters and the theaters were free and they were 24-7 and you could go all the time and get nonstop entertainment because if the people were busy being entertained, they didn't have time to plot against his own demise. He loved, to be, he loved, he loved uh, a gruesome sport and the chariot races, and they purposely made the chariot races even more deadly. And, you know, of course, his box was always the closest box to the, to the dead zone where, where, the, where the, most of the chariot accidents happened because he loved gore. And he created himself to be a god king. He's the one who took the humble second temple and renovated it and said, you know, I've been all over this world. And I've seen temples, but this little box that you have is no temple. I'm going to renovate this temple. And he did, and he, and he created a huge project. 
And actually the stones, there's a stone that is almost the length of this entire room that goes from the floor to halfway up the wall that is the cornerstone in which the temple was built upon. Nobody knows today how they moved it. Nobody. There is no technology today that can move that stone. But Herod had the technology. He was a genius. And he was a madman. Upon his, as he realized that he was getting closer on in years, he knew that nobody in Israel would mourn his death. Nobody. So he took elders from every town, village, and city throughout Israel, and he gathered them together, and he had ordered his troops that upon the hour of his death that he was to kill all the elders of Israel because he said, no one will be mourning my death, but at least they can be mourning their own, and there will be cries and wailing throughout this land upon my death. The miracle was that his wife stopped the execution. And when King Herod died, there was no one who mourned. But 10,000 people went out of work. Because with his death, the construction in Israel also ceased. So I talk about King Herod in this way because you might ask yourself that you know that he's, he's going to plan the massacre of babies. Like, what kind of leader is going to massacre babies? This kind of leader. This kind of man. This man who was, who was so crazy and so paranoid, so full of himself, that this was the picture of one of the greatest kings because he expanded the land, he expanded prosperity, he expanded peace within Israel. He, he, he allowed the people to be able to flourish, he allowed Jerusalem to be able to flourish. And so there was this dichotomy, this warping in the culture about what a king was going to be. And as they were expecting the Messiah, as they were expecting the king, because they were experts at the Bible. They were experts at Daniel's prophecies. They had calculated how many years that the Messiah would actually come, and they were eagerly waiting for the Messiah. The times leading up to this moment under King Herod were very, very, uh, you know, it was just filled with constant letdown and constant false messiahs. There were at least three to four very prominent people who all claimed to be the Messiah before Jesus ever came. You need to know that there was such political turmoil in Rome and so many things going on that there was, there was so much confusion, there was so much lust, there was so much uh, perversion, there was so much failure within the government that these little stories were able to happen. But because people were so consumed with themselves, they missed the true signs. So what are the true signs? There was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abiyah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now, Zechariah. Now, how many of you just got like goosebumps when I read that? Yeah, exactly. Then most of you here, there was a priest, Zechariah, who had an old wife, blah, 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 blah. Right? Next one. When he went in to the altar, what is the altar of incense? Now, you've heard about this maybe before. Now, if you look at it, this is not a replica of the altar of incense. This is the actual altar of incense for the next temple. There is a, an institute in Jerusalem called the Temple Institute, and they have already created the implements for the next temple. And so it's amazing because if you go and you see, it's not a museum of the past. It's a warehouse for the future when they actually want the next temple to be built. Next one, please. 
Now, when we begin to think, like, what was Zechariah's role? He was a direct descendant of Aaron. That meant he was actually a priest. And the priests had responsibilities and duties before the Lord. And now you might think, like, well, what is this idea about Abijah, Abiyah? Is, is that there were 24 orders of priesthood. None of that's really important. But because of historical records, we can know that, this t- that he, his group was on duty only twice a year. One week out of the year, uh, one week twice a year, his group was on duty at the temple. And this particular time most likely took place around the second week of July on our calendar. So something small like this little thing can let us know how did this happen in history? Where did this happen in time? But something more important happened. Next one. Oh, no, leave it. Uh, Previous one, I'm sorry. So if we're looking at these two pictures here, you can Google these things. These are actual clothes for the priesthood. Again, these aren't just replicas. They're actually waiting for real priests. So we have your normal priest which is here that has the the linen turban and and the clothing and the belt and all of these things. But if you notice their feet, yeah, that's right. The feet, they were always barefoot. See, even God asked you to take your shoes off before you go inside. And then on this other side, we also have the high priest and what the high priest used to wear and how he used to look different. It's an awful lot of clothing. I can't imagine it's all stone. Can you imagine in winter having to, like, walk on that stone? So they said that they've come up with a solution, thanks, I think, to Korea. Um, They're going to have floor heating in the next temple so that the priests won't have to have cold feet when they go. But next one. This is a painting of what that temple would have looked like on the inside. So if you see in the front... You have him where the altar of incense was. And on the right were the table of showbread. That's where the, the, the bread that they brought out every single week, which was given unto God. And then you had the menorahs that were lit to give light to the entire chamber. And then behind that curtain that was directly in front of you there is the Holy of Holies. So just so when you're thinking about this little story, realize it wasn't like going into a closet and the man went in alone, and he lit the, the, the incense alone. He was in a great big open space where his other priests were busy doing their work, where they were doing their job. He wasn't just alone, but the Levites and the people, they can't go inside this place. Only the priests are allowed to go inside. And you begin to think about this particular story. Now, something that is even more profound, I think, that's absolutely amazing is because there were so many people, right? By this point, they have thousands and thousands and thousands of workers, far more workers than actual jobs that need to be done. And so that was one of the reasons they only had to be on for one week. Can you imagine? I think that would be a lovely schedule for a pastor. That's right. What? Full-time, full-time benefits and I only have to be there two weeks out of the year? That would be great. That's what he got to do. And because the special jobs... Like, only twice a day did they ever light the incense. So that means only 14 people out of the 1,000 plus that was part of this family got to light incense in any given year. And they drew lots. Eeny, meeny, miny, who's going to win? And can you imagine that Zechariah, year after year, never ever got his name drawn. Because once your name was drawn, once you were picked one time, your name is removed. And you're no longer eligible to have those duties because so few people get to do it. Year after year, his name wasn't drawn. Year after year, his name wasn't picked. Do you ever feel like your life is on hold? Do you ever feel like the thing that you really wish you could do and really want to do and maybe even know that inside somehow you're destined for something but don't know what that something is? Zachariah was this kind of man. 
And he waited and he waited year after year, and he's finally advanced in years. What does that mean? It means he's earing, nearing the date in which the priesthood, they had a retirement of the age 50. Now, the retirement of age 50 doesn't mean you stop working. It just means that the actual service... Can, okay, so when you get to 50, you no longer have to be part of storage ministry. Is that exciting? But when you get to 50, then certain things were no longer allowed for you because they have to be done perfectly. That meant he was nearly the end of his eligibility. And can you imagine that God waited until he was of advanced years towards the end of his service in which Lot after Lot, his name was never drawn. And finally, his name was drawn. And he goes into this temple and he lights the incense. And when he lights the incense, the angel appears to him. See, sometimes you think that when this angel appeared, there were no witnesses. But there were witnesses. And everybody is going to start to hear of this story. Sometimes you think that, what, you know, that these stories happened in secret. And we don't realize, no, this is a famous family. This is an important family. Now, this family just became far more famous, far more important. And the angel comes and says, you're going to have a son. What does that sound like to you? Who else in his ancient old years was told he was going to have a baby? Abraham. So immediately, we have to begin to realize that when there's coincidences, there's no coincidence. And that the Bible and the author of this book wants you to start thinking about Abraham. He wants you to start thinking about the original promise. He wants you to begin to think about the covenant of God, which has never changed. So therefore, you will know, you, Theophilus, you who are so far removed, you, if you're a Roman, you weren't even part of these covenants. You weren't part of these promises. But yet Abraham, he too was a pagan. And God chose Abraham and brought Abraham to himself. And Abraham had faith and believed in God. And it was accounted for him as righteous. And it says here that Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were blameless before God. Does that mean they never sinned? No. It meant that they had faith in who God is. Sin isn't that which disqualifies you from your life with God. Unrepented sin and the lack of faith or belief in God disqualifies you. He believed. He believed, and they want you to believe this story is true. This passage is real. These people are real, and we have historical evidence to be able to corroborate all of these things. And it was so exciting, but then he didn't believe. And so what happened? That's right, took away his voice. See, our people, we're stiff-necked people. What does that mean? We don't like to learn, not when it comes to life lessons. Same thing happened to Sarah. She laughed. But this is setting up a greater miracle. This is the forerunner. And this is what was said. It was that he was going to come and he was going to turn the hearts of the children to the father's. And the fathers, back to the children, the great promise of Malachi, one of those great last prophecies that was stating that the time is at hand, that the Messiah is going to come. And indeed, that is the case. The Messiah was going to be coming. But first, we needed the witness, the one who would go forth in power, the one who would go forth in prophecy, the one who would go forth, who, was, who, who all the nation would begin to recognize. Poor John, he never had a chance. Some people are born into destiny and have no chance. And he, and he was told that your son is not allowed to touch anything from the grape. He has to be a Nazarite. Who was one of the most first famous Nazarites in all of Scripture? Samson. I like his Hebrew name, Shimshon. Shimmy. Samson with his lovely hair. But was Samson a righteous judge? 
See, Samson started to do what was right in his own eyes. But already we're, we're going to be filled. Is it possible because we had the Philistines were there and corrupting Israel and Israel were, were backwards and Israel were far away from God and Israel had no hope and no help and there needed to be a judge to arise. And so we're going to play upon these pictures. What kind of judge is John going to be? What kind of king is the Messiah going to be? And there was such a desire because Herod was so oppressive. A heathen sat upon the throne of Israel. Rome had conquered us and we had not been an independent nation truly serving God since before Babylon. Hundreds and hundreds of years. Nearly 500 years we've been waiting. 500 years to this moment. And all of the theologians would start talking all of the theologians would start wondering and start searching the scriptures to put the story together. Why is this so important to us? Because if we're living in these last times, if we're living in the end of days, if we are possibly like every generation that went before us, could we be the generation that sees the coming of Jesus? We too will begin to see the replica of these types of events. And which side will we fall on? Arrogance, pride, humility, longing. Will we keep faith to believe that Jesus is real, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is king? Will they keep faith that God was going to be true to Abraham? And would be true to Isaac. He would be true to Jacob. He would be true to Moses. He would be true to David. He would be true to Daniel. He would be true to each and every prophet. And we're coming to this fullness of time. And the incense was being burnt in the altar. A fragrant offering to the Lord. The very picture of worship. Today we don't burn incense. We sing songs. Today, we don't kill animals, we offer our lives. Today, we don't go to a building and wait outside while a priest goes in and does the work for us. But we welcome the great high priest into our hearts, into our lives to transform us. Are we going to live in this time? Are we going to live with this knowledge? Will we believe that which God has begun to say? In verse 26, we have another angelic visitation. Gabriel was very, very busy. Where he was before this, we have no idea. Except he is the one who was next to God. And he comes to a city called Galilee, now this word city is very generous. Because Galilee, you know, the, Nazareth is no city. Today it's a city. Back in Jesus' time, it was barely a village. And it's a small village nestled on the top of some mountains. Just a couple hundred people. That's being generous. It was very, very poor. See, after the Babylonian exile, the line of David was diminished, humiliated. The direct line of King David wasn't welcomed back into Jerusalem. See, when, when they began to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, they, they didn't want to reinstitute the line of David and there was just governors as, as proxies. But then over time and, and history, Syria eventually comes in and conquers. And after Syria conquers, uh, they, they outlaw all Hebrew in the land. They outlaw the teaching of Torah in the land. They outlaw the worship to the one true God in the land. They actually set up a pagan idol in the temple to their own God and sacrifice pigs upon the altars. 
And then when the, when the freedom fighters rose up and they began to, to rise up and they, they had a very successful insurgence for, for several years. But instead of passing things back to the way that it was supposed to be, and instead of allowing the line of David to return to, the, to become king and allowing the line of Aaron to return to be the high priest, they established themselves who were neither of the tribe of Judah nor of the line of Aaron and set themselves up to both be high priest and king. And this is very important because this begins to create something in the identity of Israel, something that began to twist the the elite and twist the religion is what is the view of our God? Who is our God? Who is our king? And Jesus is going to confront this all throughout this book is this idea of a kingdom and a king. Because for several hundred years, you had false kings and false high priests. And they were never supposed to be the same according to Torah. Only one king was both king and high priest, and that was Melchizedek. Melchizedek goes right back to Abraham. Abraham offered his tithes and his offerings to Melchizedek. And that's why it said that the Messiah was going to be of the order of Melchizedek, not Levitical. Not from the book of Leviticus. But Israel was in disobedience. And it led to disobedience. And it led to disobedience. And so you have the line of David, diminished, poor, living in the countryside, not in the land of their ancestors, not in what was supposed to be their inheritance, but in, a, in, a, in, in the mountains in which that they, they lived mostly partly in caves, and then they built out of the caves where they kept their animals during the winter as their heat. And there was a lot of work, though, very close to Nazareth. But even the word Nazareth, Netzeret, it actually comes from, have you seen an olive tree? Anyone? And with the olive tree, out of the base of an olive tree, little shoots grow up. And those shoots that grow up from the ground out of the olive tree are called the Netzeret. And then it begins to twist and combine with the trunk of the olive tree. And that little branch that that, that should be nothing all of a sudden becomes one with the olive tree, making the olive tree stronger, more vibrant, more fruitful. And that's why the first believers were called Netzeret. So even at this small little town is this, this, this Netzeret, this small little olive shoot of nothing is a picture of what our Messiah is going to be. You have to realize that the pictures and the word pictures that the book of Luke gives is something that is so rich and deep to make you realize that every word is important. And in this insignificant town, village, hamlet, In the middle of nowhere, an angel comes to an insignificant girl. Now, her name is Mary. Or in Hebrew, her name is Miriam. This is also very important because the writers of the Bible, um, the translators of the Bible, excuse me, in history, they, they didn't want New Testament heroes to have the same names as Old Testament people. So that's why Mary is called Mary or Maria and not Miriam. Because who was the famous Miriam? Moses' sister. His Nuna. And this is important because Miriam is going to be a picture of Moses' sister even here. Because right after the angel comes. And then she goes to her cousin. She gets a song from the Lord, a prophetic song from God, just like Miriam when Israel crossed the Red Sea and the Lord delivered them from Egypt, delivered them from Pharaoh, delivered them from slavery, delivered them unto himself. Miriam got the prophetic word. Not Aaron, not a man. Do you see that it's important to realize that God honors both men and women. He doesn't value either higher nor lower. Not one is more subservient to him, for we are all equal before him. And God uses both in his honoring. And so when Mary receives this song from him, uh, from the Lord in verse 46, 
We're joining in with all of those great prophetesses from, from Miriam or Deborah. And then to begin to realize that the Holy Spirit was moving and working. It wasn't a silent time. It wasn't a dead time. I don't know who or why people began to say that, that those years between Malachi and, and Matthew were, were silent years. They were not silent years. For no one was surprised when Zechariah received a prophecy from God. And no one is surprised that Miriam, mother of Jesus, would also receive a prophecy from God. And she begins to sing out, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble and as the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, and he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent Away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Amen. The song of the Lord. And I pray that during this week, I pray that you begin to get inside of you the song of the Lord, the excitement. Now, was Jesus born at this time? Some historian, one maybe, tried to create a, a case where Jesus was actually born at this time. Other historians I, I read about actually say Jesus was conceived at this time. Do we know? No. Can we have certainty? No. And we shouldn't because God doesn't want us to build an idol to baby Jesus. He doesn't want us to build an idol to Gabriel. He doesn't want us to build an idol to Mary. He wants us to know that he is the faithful God, that he is the true God, that even though it's been thousands of years, thousands of years, we don't even know how much time since the fall of Adam and Eve when they were in the garden and after that fall that there was a prophecy that there would be the seed of Eve who would come and though the serpent would bruise his heel, he would crush the head of the serpent. This is the time. And I pray that you get awakened again to the joy of your salvation, awakened again to this knowledge and this great thing that God has and this story which is going to come alive that just as we can identify with Miriam who did not, I mean, can you imagine like this young woman totally freaking out that she's going to have a baby? I mean, she's going to have a baby. What are the people going to say? She knew she had not been with any men, and yet her, her cousin, could be cousin, could be aunt, you know, the, the time frame is very different. But her cousin Elizabeth, just like Sarah in old age, just like Hannah who was barren and had cried out to the Lord for, for a son, she was with child because there was going to be a greater miracle that the Holy Spirit would come upon a virgin and conceive and she would bear a son and that son is going to change the world and the son of Elizabeth is going to change the world. And after several months, Mary returns to Nazareth. Elizabeth gives birth to John. beloved, John the friend, John in the spirit of Elijah, John the Nazarite who never had grape jam, he never had grapes, he never had grape juice, he never had vinegar, he never had wine. And John grew and became strong in spirit 
and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. John, from the tribe of Levite, from the descendancy of Aaron, a priest filled with the Holy Spirit from birth, grew up in the wilderness of Judea, in the mountains, amongst the people who were seeking God. And people watched him, wanting to know, who's this child that an angel showed up on the day of worship when the incense, the fragrant offering was being burnt to God and this angel shows up and gives a prophecy to an old man in the end of his service to God was honored above all the other priests for how many generations upon generations in this hope that the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our salvation, our hope, what is gonna happen, the restoration of the line of David, the destruction, of Rome, the deliverance of Egypt, the death of sin, the fullness of the Bible come alive yet again in our day and our time. It is not the time of our rejection or our humiliation, but it's going to be the time of our exaltation, not because of who we are, but because of who God is, who the King is, who the Lord is. And this is the God and the King who is alive today. This is the God who sends angels today. This is the God who brings the Holy Spirit upon you today, that you would bear witness to who he is. You are the witnesses. Zechariah in his faith of the order of Abiyah, who was a priest of the line of Aaron, in his faithfulness went to be a witness before God and offered the incense unto God and the fragrant smoke unto God, doing his duty. But in the same way that you, through Jesus, in you has called you to be a priesthood, not the priesthood of Aaron, not the priesthood of Levi, but you, from the nation that you come from, the family that you come from, you too are to kindle that fire. You too are to kindle that incense. You too are to bear witness and the faith and the belief that the Messiah is coming again. You are the forerunner today of the Messiah who is coming again. You will have greater power than Elijah had because the Holy Spirit, our God and King himself, is inside of you, and you are going to be the witnesses to all that you believe to be true. You are going to now be the witnesses and the examples to the world around you. Amen? This is just the introduction. The story begins. Next week, we're going to have our, our party that remembers the birth of the Messiah. Next Sunday is going to be a fun day filled with many things. But we are going to go into the birth of Jesus and what it foretold and what it looks like that you would know that this king that you believe in, this Jesus that we profess and that we worship, the whole reason that we're even celebrating and we're remembering that you would know that it was true. And I pray that the Lord would take this word and would hide it in your hearts. I pray that the prophecies of Elizabeth, Zechariah, and Mary would awaken your heart to receive prophecies today. They weren't prophets. But by the Holy Spirit, they were able to prophesy the goodness of God, the encouragement of God, the lifting up of God. And I pray that that's what you get today. I pray that that's what you do this week. I pray that that as, as, can you imagine, like, we know the after effect. We don't have to be afraid, like, you know, are they going to kill Mary because she's pregnant and she's, she's out of wedlock? And how did that happen? We know that she gave birth to the Messiah. We know the end of the story. But why do we know it? Why do we believe it? And I pray that God would open the eyes of your heart, the understandings of your mind and your spirit, that you would know that you know that you know that you know and what you know that you know is true. A lot of no's. That you would know that it is true. Not every week will be this long, I promise. (laughs) 
just the introduction because we're having to lead up to, you know, it just fits for next week. But I pray that you get into the word. And whatever you're studying, even if you're not going to be studying Luke because we're going to be doing it here, whatever you're studying and, and you want to talk about it, talk about it. Come share. My love language is questions. Please feel free. That's why I'm here. I want to talk about these things with you that you would become the mature believer that I know that you're called and destined to be, that you would be most excellent Theophilus, the friend of God. Amen? So may the Spirit of the Lord rest upon you. As you read and study his word, may it become alive in you. May these not just be words on a page, pixels on a screen, but may it become the very essence of your being, a foundational truth that will never be shaken. In Jesus' name, amen.